I got into science and research because I loved answering questions. It is the excitement of a cryptic crossword puzzle. Pitting your wits against biology. Standing on the edge of what we know and don't know about human biology. You can't do anything on your own. You can't be an expert in everything. And what you really need is collaboration. The problems we are facing these days are much bigger than just on a very little scale. So we need to get input from all different kind of areas to see the bigger picture of it. Without that collaborative network, we simply wouldn't be able to make progress. We collaborate every day with St Vincent's Hospital, every day with the University of New South Wales, Prince of Wales and Melbourne and beyond, Seattle, New York, Cambridge. It is a global endeavour and we are we're right at the, the front of this bus. It's fantastic. The pace of acquisition of new knowledge is so great you need to work closely with clinicians to translate that into new ways to prevent and treat disease quickly. The Garvin has a tremendous history, perhaps better than any other institute in this country, of intimate involvement with the clinical endeavour through St Vincent's Hospital and beyond. We're currently using the latest gene sequencing technologies to identify particular mutations in the genes that cause inherited kidney disease. Which is a very common disease, it affects probably one in a thousand people in Australia and probably uh, a third to a half of those people would go on to develop kidney failure. Collaboration between basic researchers and clinicians is critically important. We have formal, regular uh, meetings, usually on a weekly basis. We also informally meet, of course, on a daily basis. When we have results, we get together and discuss what's happening and uh, what we should do and what the implications are for the patient. The constant feedback between the clinician and the basic researcher uh, really drives the research and that's where the environment of the Garvin Institute on the St Vincent's campus is so important. The PROMISE project is a project aimed at understanding how tumours grow in the skeleton in men with advanced prostate cancer. It's an international collaboration between groups here at Garvin but also groups uh, in Melbourne and in the US and in Europe and it's coordinated from Garvin. One of the uh, real benefits of the PROMISE team is we bring people from other disease areas as well that traditionally wouldn't have worked on prostate cancer and ultimately we hope that's going to make a major impact on the quality of life of individuals with advanced prostate cancer. Many good things happened in 2014. We had continued success in the NHMRC grants, uh, well above the national average and among the leading institutes in the country, although there's still challenges there because of declining funding. In January, uh, Garvin was announced to be one of the first three centres in the world to acquire the technology to sequence human genomes for a base cost of $1,000 American. And during last year, we put in place the teams, the equipment, the bioinformatics, the computing infrastructure to do what we wouldn't even dreamt of 20 or 30 years ago. And within five to 10 years, undoubtedly now, everybody in society who chooses will have their genome sequenced, be part of their medical record and be used with their physician to optimise their, their health. And we were able to recruit some outstanding people last year uh, including uh, Professor David Thomas, who's the new director of the Kinghorn Cancer Centre, who's joined us from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. And later in the year, Professor Chris Goodnow from ANU, who's joined the Institute as deputy director. Given Garvin's leadership role in the use of genomic technology, the Garvin Research Foundation hosted a range of events in Canberra to discuss the opportunities and implications of this new and exciting approach to science and medicine with politicians and policymakers throughout the year. The inspiring Samuel Johnson from Love Your Sister crossed the finish line at his year-long Around Australia unicycle trek in February. During the trek, Samuel, his sister Connie and the Love Your Sister team raised more than $1.5 million for breast cancer research here at Garvin, as well as breaking the world record for the longest unicycle journey and spreading the important message about breast awareness. Throughout the rest of the year, the amount they raised jumped to more than $2 million and continues to rise. What a great example of passion and dedication combined with community spirit. I'd like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank all the generous people who volunteer their time at Garvin. The value of volunteering cannot be underestimated. 
Volunteers save Garvin tens of thousands of dollars each year in direct costs, money that we can put straight back into the vital research carried out in Garvin's labs. I would also like to thank our donors, whether it's the people who make a direct donation or those who leave a bequest to Garvin in their will, the people who take part in community events or the companies who support Garvin's work. To everyone who has recognised the importance of medical research and contributed to ensuring its future, thank you. Professor Mike Rogers has shown for the first time why drugs used to treat people with osteoporosis or cancers that have spread to bone may also benefit patients with tumours outside the skeleton, including breast cancer. The successful Garvin Risk Fracture Calculator, developed through Garvin's Dubbo Osteoporosis Genetic and Epidemiology Study, is being refined to improve its clinical use as a predictive tool for GPs. And a Garvin-led international team is investigating the spread of prostate cancer cells to the skeleton, one of the most devastating consequences of advanced prostate cancer. A discovery by Professor Leslie Campbell of a mutation in a specific gene in some obese people will help clinicians to identify this particular metabolic syndrome and suggest new courses of treatment for some people with diabetes. Dr Paul Lee's research suggests that shivering and bouts of moderate exercise are equally capable of stimulating the conversion of energy storing white fat into energy burning brown fat. Dr Lee has also shown that cool environments stimulate growth of this brown fat while warm environments promote the loss of this energy waste and fat. And in another advance, Garvin clinicians have been involved in the design and testing of a food additive that makes people feel fuller and was effective at preventing weight gain in some overweight individuals. A specific gene that regulates our body clock may play a central role in determining how much fat is stored in our body compared to lean tissue. Another study found that chronic stress may only increase appetite and lead to overeating, but more importantly causes the body to store more of the excess calories as fat rather than other tissues like muscle or bone. Furthermore, an important discovery was also made in the area of Parkinson's research with the identification of a protein that controls the level of zinc in our brain, which is very critical for normal function. A team of Garvin researchers confirmed how a small molecule known as interleukin-21 contributes to inflammation, including some fatal inflammatory conditions. Garvin's transplantation group uncovered an additional role for B cells, showing that they participate in the development of regulatory T cells. We also introduced a revolutionary new gene editing technology called CRISPR-Cas9, and this is transforming our ability to rapidly develop mouse models and rigorously test the causative link between mutations and disease. And finally, the Antibody Therapeutics Laboratory developed a new technology that answers a significant need within the pharmaceutical industry and how to create fully human antibodies that are also stable and resistant to aggregation or stickiness. Garvin-led research has suggested the possibility of identifying novel cancer susceptibility genes, particularly for deadly diseases like pancreatic cancer. At the same time, we're trying to develop risk management and screening programs for people with these diseases because we know if we detect them early, potentially we can get them when they're curable. Another discovery by Garvin-led researchers has uncovered how massive DNA molecules, which we coin cancer neochromosomes, appear in some tumours. We call them also Frankenstein chromosomes because they're stitched together from the body parts of other parts of the genome. This discovery has solved a decades-old mystery uh, about how these cancers form and also has unlocked potential opportunities for their treatment. We are really leading the country and one of the leaders around the world in the whole new technology around genome sequencing. It's the philanthropic support we have which allows us to do that, to attack the future, be big and bold. If you want to make a step change, then sometimes you have to be prepared to take some risks with projects and this is where philanthropic support can really play a critical role. We're really dependent on support from visionary people who can see the need for medical research. When you actually feel like you're pushing back the frontiers of knowledge and helping people, I mean, they're fabulous. So passion comes naturally. <laughs>